All right, welcome to e-learning day one. So this is the lesson for Wednesday. And um, in lab today, which is Tuesday, we looked at how the period of a, pen of a mass on a spring depends on its mass. So we're going to extend that. So let's talk about springs for a minute. Springs can be stretched, and we characterize them by a constant, which we call the spring constant. So the spring constant is this thing we represent by k, and it tells us how strong or how stiff a spring is. So for example, if the spring constant is 1 newton per meter, that's a very weak spring. It means a force of 1 newton will stretch it a whole meter. Okay, so 1 newton stretches it a whole meter is a pretty weak spring. Now that doesn't mean the spring can actually stretch a whole meter. Maybe 0.1 newtons stretches it 0.1 meters. So if you take the um, force and you divide it by the distance that that force stretches it, you get the spring constant. So that's a very weak spring. A spring constant of 25 newtons per meter is a little bit of a stiffer spring. So this is like the spring I had hanging from the ceiling in my room. It takes a force of 25 newtons to stretch it a meter. And so we say the spring constant is 25 newtons per meter. And then a spring constant of 500,000 newtons per meter is a very strong spring. So this would be like the coil spring that your car rides on that connects your, your axle to the frame of your car. Those are very big, strong springs. So you would need half a million newtons to stretch it a meter. And those springs don't stretch a meter, but for example, a force of 50,000 newtons would only stretch at 0.1 meters or 10 centimeters. Okay, so we characterize springs by a spring constant, which is how many newtons it takes to stretch it a meter. All right, so if we have a spring, it produces what is called a linear restoring force. So what this means is that the spring, together with Earth's gravity, produce a net force that always try to keep a mass at equilibrium. So let me show you what I mean by that. Let's suppose I have a, um, a spring, I'm going to do this, um, and I've got 200 grams hanging on this spring. So 200 grams hanging on this spring. Now, if I pull the spring down, so we call, so, sorry, this position right here where it rests, we call that equilibrium. If I pull the mass down, the spring pulls up on it, trying to get it back to equilibrium. If I lift the spring up, then gravity pulls down, trying to get it back to equilibrium. And so that is what we call a restoring force. It's trying to keep the mass right here where the net force is zero. If you move it from that point, the spring and gravity work together to oppose that change. So pulling it down, causes the net force up. Lifting it up causes the net force down. And it's a, it's a linear restoring force because if I pull it down a little bit, the net force will be up a little bit. But if I pull it down a lot, the net force will be really big. So how big the force is is proportional to how far I pull it from equilibrium. So that's what we call a linear restoring force. It's a force that tries to restore this mass to equilibrium. And the ideal springs work in this way. So the spring produces a linear restoring force. And when you have a linear restoring force and you have a mass and you displace the mass from equilibrium, you get simple harmonic motion. So if I have, for example, um, a mass here and I pull it down, the force is going to pull it up till it gets to here. But once it gets to here, although there's no force on it right then, it's moving, it has inertia, and so it moves past this point. Now the force is downward, slowing it down till it stops it and it speeds it up and it reverses direction. So this oscillates. And the time it takes to complete a cycle is, as you know, the period. So when you have a linear restoring force acting on a mass and that mass is disturbed, it oscillates and it um, follows what we call simple harmonic motion and I'll show you why we call it that. You can play with that simulator I was just showing you there. You can stop the video and go to this website and, uh, and get it if you want to play with that simulator yourself. So if I have a mass on a spring moving up and down and I plot its position versus time, it turns out you get these really nice sine and cosine waves. 
And sine and cosine waves are called the harmonic functions by mathematicians. So that's why we call it a harmonic motion, because its motion is described by a sine or a cosine. Now, you don't need to know all that. Don't worry about it. But that's why we call it harmonic motion. So it turns out that in lab, we found out that the period of our mass was proportional to the square root, excuse me, the period of the mass was proportional to the square root of the mass. We found that in lab. What we didn't explore in lab was the effect of the spring constant. If we would have had different springs with different stiffnesses, we could have investigated this, but we didn't. So you're just going to take it from me. But here's the basic idea. If the spring gets, if this number here gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that means the spring gets stiffer and stiffer, then the period gets smaller and smaller. So the period is inversely proportional to the spring constant. Okay? So a bigger spring constant makes a smaller period. It takes less time to vibrate back and forth. On the other hand, the bigger mass causes a bigger period. The bigger the mass is, the more inertia it has, the longer it takes to turn it around and go the other direction. So T, the period, is bigger. It takes more time to um, oscillate. So this is the equation we're going to use. It's very similar to the pendulum. The pendulum is 2 pi L over G. And they're related in really deep ways, which we'll explore in AP physics. But for now, we're just going to use this equation to solve some problems, OK? So quickly, conceptually, if the period is proportional to the square root of the mass, if the mass gets four times bigger, then the period will get the square root of four times bigger or two times bigger. So the first two questions on your homework assignment are these kind of conceptual questions, all right? What happens if k gets four times bigger? Well, since this is in the denominator and it's under a square root, if k gets four times bigger, then t will get the square root of four times smaller or two times smaller. All right. Okay, so let me show you two example problems solving uh, problems with this. A bungee cord is an example of a restoring force. If we were to just hang you from a bungee cord, you would reach equilibrium. If we then pulled you down, you would bounce down and up and down and up and down and up. So um, I have a bungee cord example here. We have a 50 kilogram person, and the spring constant of the bungee cord is 65 newtons per meter. That means a force of 65 newtons will stretch the bungee cord one meter. So we want to know what is the period of oscillation of a person who jumps off of a, a bridge or something attached to a bungee cord. They're going to bounce up and down for a while. And we want to know what is the period of their oscillation. So the mass is 50 kilograms. The spring constant is 65 newtons per meter. And we're trying to find the period. So we will simply evaluate the equation t equals 2 pi square root of m over k. Plug in our values, run it through your calculator, and you get 5.5 seconds. So it takes 5.5 seconds from this person to go from the bottom all the way back up and then back down on their bounce. Now bungee cords are kind of complicated because sometimes you're swinging back and forth this way too. But that's how long it would take you to go up and down, your oscillation up and down. All right, one more example. Suppose I had one kilogram and I put it on a spring and I measured the period to be 1.7 seconds. What is the spring constant of this system? So draw yourself a little mass on a spring. List what you know. You know the mass is one kilogram. You know the period is 1.7 seconds, and you're looking for k. So we are going to have to solve this equation for k. And k occurs inside the radical and in the denominator. So the first thing I would do is square everything. So you're going to get t squared. You're going to get 4 squared, pi squared, and of course the square of a square root is just m over k. Now we're trying to find k, so the next thing I would do is I'd multiply both sides by k, because you've got to get k out of the denominator. If you multiply both sides by k, you get kt squared equals 4 pi squared m. And now to get k by itself, you can divide both sides by t squared, and there you have an algebraic solution for the spring constant. You can plug in your numbers and you can show it's about 13.7 newtons per meter. So you can solve this problem for the spring constant. All right, so that's two examples. We're just going to be solving problems in this assignment involving this equation right here, um, solving for one of the unknowns. And remember, same as with a pendulum, 
if you have the frequency, that's equal to 1 over the period. So the frequency equals 1 over the period, the period equals 1 over the frequency. That is still true for masses on springs as well as for pendulums. All right, okay, so find your assignment, get going there, um, and uh, if you have any questions, take a picture of what you've got so far and email it to me and I'll get back to you with some help. I'll also be online for some hours, which I will um, post and email to you, so keep an eye out for that. If you actually want to meet me online um, on, a, on a Google Meet, I'll be on, I'll have some office hours the next couple days. Okay? All right. Good luck.